So we are 20 minutes into our bus journey to Inlay Lake and we have made it approximately 30 feet in the gridlocked strip mall parking lot that is the Yangon bus station. Um, this bus is like an it might have been nice in the 80s, but it is no longer very nice. AC doesn't appear to be working, and it feels like it's going to be a very long night. Hello and welcome to the World Wanderers Podcast, your source for travel stories, travel destinations, and travel philosophy. I'm Amanda. I'm Ryan. And we're your hosts. What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the World Wanderers podcast and to part two of our adventure in Myanmar. On the last episode, we took you to Yangon, to the Golden Rock, and then left you as we were heading out to Inlay Lake, which is where we're going to pick it up on this episode. Yeah, so if you haven't listened to last week's episode, go back an episode and listen to Myanmar part one, and then meet us back here. And we left you last episode in a gridlocked parking lot with a ton of honking and lots of noisy chanting happening on the bus. And we were stuck basically in the Yangon bus station for probably about the first 30 minutes of our 12-hour bus trip over to Inlay Lake. And so to set the stage a little bit, if you're going on a budget backpacking trip to Myanmar, you're probably going to get yourself into a few overnight buses. Now that tourism has been going for the better part of a decade, there are what are called VIP buses, which are still kind of hit and miss, but for those overnight trips, and that's the one we were taking from Yangon to Inlay Lake, and um, would take again later on in our trip as well. Yeah, and so I think just giving a little bit of context is we kind of had an expectation of what a VIP bus would be like. And I don't know if we had, I I wouldn't say our expectation was that it would be really, really nice. Maybe an image. I think we knew going in that we were kind of rolling the dice. And then when we got there, we found out that it wasn't a good roll. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's not very many bus companies that have really, really like high first class executive style buses. Or even that's, that's neat. That, that bar is really high too. It's, there's not that many companies that even have like new ish buses. A lot of them are old. Yeah. So we were on a quote unquote VIP bus. Um, I mean, we got safely there, so I think it was fine, but we, we got onto it and the aircon didn't seem to be working. It seemed to be like it was, you know, nice maybe back in its time in like the eighties. And so, after spending 30 minutes in this gridlocked parking lot of the Yangon bus station, we kind of had this feeling like it was going to be an extremely long night. And it wasn't, it wasn't. I think I got a little bit of sleep, but definitely arrived in Inlay Lake feeling like fairly tired. What about you? Yeah. It was started off a bit rough. The bus seemed to be overheating or something because he would, the driver would keep stopping on the side of the road. There's no bathroom. And I think after backpacking South America, and for any of you guys who have been down there and done that, you get this impression, and you kind of get used to really nice bus. If you see, oh, it's a VIP bus, you're like, ooh, maybe it's going to be nice, and there'll be a washroom on board, and uh, it'll be a service or something. And there's definitely not, not the same standard that's held to in Myanmar, which is totally, totally to be expected. But the thing about Myanmar is that as it's getting better, there's a few buses on a few companies that are nice. And, but when you book through your hostel or even, you know, some of the same companies, you'll take a bus that's not very nice and you'll see parked right beside you a nice new looking bus. Yeah, for sure. And so there are other options to get to Inlay Lake. There is a domestic flight that flies from Yangon to Inlay Lake, which if you're on more of a vacation to Myanmar or you're a digital nomad who makes like a steady income somewhere based out of Asia and you're just taking going to Myanmar as a trip, I think that this would be a great option. It's about $20 per person to take the bus and it's about like $100, $150 to take a plane. So it is quite a bit more, but it's also like a one-hour flight versus a 12-hour 
bus ride. So it's something we thought about. It just wasn't really in the budget for us for this trip. But I think that if I was going to go back, I would travel Myanmar with just a little bit more disposable income so I could do things like that. Yeah, it's a complicated country because it, it is very poor and you look around and things are quite cheap. But to 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 be there as a tourist because there is so much... Um, cronyism and regulation on people who that can do business with tourists it's quite expensive so things like buses flights guest houses end up costing a lot but to speak to the point about the, the plane tickets i think it's definitely worth it if you can afford it because you'll look on a map of myanmar and see oh point a to point b yangon to inlay lake that doesn't seem that far at all but then you hop in a bus and 10 hours later you're still chugging along yeah and i think part of it is that you you travel on a main highway for some of it and then you turn off to get to inlay and you go on a very steep windy sort of more gravelly type road and it just really slows you down it being in a big bus you just can't go that fast so we had some friends that we had met who opted for the flight i think they left at like six in the morning arrived at like I don't know, eight in the morning or something like that. They arrived fresh, ready to see the lake. We had been on a bus all night, arrived at like six in the morning and were absolutely exhausted and not super stoked to see the lake. So I think it just depends. Your time is worth money. So just making a decision based on your, your budget. Absolutely. So we check in next on a walk that we went on to a tiny little town called Nantha that's just outside Nguyen Shui. <laughs> which is the tourist town where the majority of people stay while they're at Inlay Lake. And we tell you a little bit more about our overnight bus and our first impressions of Inlay. So we are currently in the tiny, tiny town of Nantha, which is right near Inlay Lake. So we arrived here about 6.30 this morning after kind of a interesting bus journey overnight uh, we stopped a couple times on the bus for food and pee breaks, and it seemed like every time I kind of started to fall asleep, uh, the bus would stop again. Did you find the same thing? Yeah, I didn't sleep overly well on the bus, but it started off like there was chanting and then 80s Burmese covers of rock albums, so... Um, it started off much worse than it ended up actually being. Yeah, I think around maybe like 10 or 11, like kind of after our first stop, they turned off all of the noise, which was nice. So the route that you take to get from Yangon to Inlay Lake is you take a newer highway for most of it, about to the area where the new capital is. And it seems like a relatively nice highway from our experience, but I guess it's kind of shoddily put together and lots of people have actually died. Is that what you read? Yeah, because they quickly built it, um, a lot of safety issues happened. Yeah, fortunately, we didn't experience any of that. We had a really pleasant journey, and then we turned up into the to head into the mountains, and it got a lot bumpier, a lot windier, and that was a little bit of a crazy portion of the journey, but by then I was well into attempting to sleep, so I didn't see too much of it with my eye mask on. So we arrived at the stop that we had to get off of about 6 this morning, would you say? Yeah, about that. And then we had to hop into a taxi to get to the town that we're currently staying in. Fortunately, we're staying at a hostel that has, for us, it was early check-in, but for people who can't check in, um, if their room's not ready, uh, they have some, some beds that you can sleep on upstairs, which is really awesome. So we were able to get a couple hours of sleep this morning before setting out to explore a little bit. And there's not actually that much to do in the town. It's kind of more about taking the boat adventure to the lake, which we're planning to do tomorrow. So today we're just exploring this little town that's in walking distance, um, eating some good food. There's lots of good restaurants because there's a ton of tourists in the town and just taking it in. We arrived really early in the morning to Inlay Lake or to the town that's near Inlay Lake. And we had a moment of decision where it was we could go out to the lake immediately or we could spend that first day in the town and then go out hopefully the next day. And we decided, okay, we're a bit tired. We probably wouldn't enjoy the lake that much if we went right now. And it was about, the sun was just coming up. It was a beautiful, sunny day. And so we went out for a bit of a walk, came back, and then later that afternoon it started raining, and it didn't stop for almost 48 hours. 
Yeah. And it, it wasn't so bad in the evening when it started raining because we were basically just getting dinner, hanging out and then going to bed. Um, but it was waking up the next day and having this tour that we wanted to go onto the lake and realizing that, you know, it's probably not the best move to go on the lake when it's pouring rain. It's going to be miserable to be like in a boat all day for six hours when we don't have rain jackets and we don't have rain ponchos. And so we canceled our tour and kind of had just a very slow day because there's not that much to do in Nung Shui outside of go and visit the lake. And it felt like every time we left our hostel, we were almost immediately soaked. We had a hard time finding places to eat or to go hang out at because it, uh, electricity is super unstable in Myanmar in general. And this tiny little town with all the rain, it was some places were supported by generators. Many weren't so as just kind of like sitting there watching the rain pour down. And I, I definitely found it to be a challenging and frustrating day for me. And it's tough in, in Myanmar as well because there are these defined places which are really big attractions for people to go, but you kind of get this feeling when you're there and it's pouring rain and it's not very nice. You're kind of like, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that day was... I don't, like definitely a day where I learned, I guess like one of those like teaching days where you kind of like have to take a moment, step back, realize what you're learning from it. Cause I just felt frustrated. I felt like I was like bashing my head against a wall constantly all day. Like it was like, okay, we can't go on this tour. Let's go get a nice breakfast then go to get a nice breakfast. We can't do that because you know, the power's out. Let's go get coffee. Oh, we can't do that. Let's like do some work. Oh, we can't do that. Cause the internet's down. Cause there's no electricity and then feeling guilty about kind of this being this like major first world problem. But yeah, so like people listening are probably like, it's Myanmar. What did you expect? Right. Yeah, definitely. And I think that that's part of what I was battling with is like, I was really genuinely frustrated that I was not able to do anything that I wanted to do that day. And then I was also battling with like, you know, this is like real life for people. Like people live with this constantly and I should just be, you know, drinking it in and having this experience and learning from it, I guess. But I was, I was really struggling with that. I think though, for people listening, power and electricity is something that goes out fairly often in, in Myanmar and it's specifically in a place like Nung Shui, right by Inle Lake. So maybe don't come expecting to use high speed Wi Fi. Although well, apparently the town's getting fiber optic. Yeah, and we weren't really expecting it either. It just made it kind of Right, yeah, we were expecting to spend the day on the lake. And so the day kind of turned around in the afternoon. Um, we got an email from some friends that we met in Yangon and we ended up going to a cafe who actually, that actually did have electricity. We got some coffee. We had some great conversation and it actually felt like one of the days that we would have had on one of our past trips when we weren't working. I feel like a lot of our free time when we're not exploring now is with our heads buried into our laptops doing work. And it was nice to just spend an afternoon kind of like chilling out, meeting some people, um, connecting with like-minded people and just relaxing a little bit. And so we had one more day left in inlay and we're hoping that the sun was going to come out and that it was going to work out for us to take a trip out to the lake. After a full day of pouring rain, we finally made it on to Inlay Lake. There's, I mean, boat drivers all over the town. Like, if you walk around, you're going to get asked if you want to do a boat tour. We booked through our hostel, and they had kind of two options you could do. The one tour that just went on the lake or one that went on the lake and then went a little bit further to a different village. Um, and we took the shorter, just like trip, um, which leaves from Nyong Shui. You go out through the canal, canals into the lake, see quite a few fishermen, uh, and then stop at a few different floating villages um, and then to a few touristy trinket type shops. Yeah, and there's kind of like a famous image. I guess, of Inlay Lake, which I think has had to become popular, of a fisherman on like a long boat. He's standing on the, the front of it with paddling with one of his legs. So they actually hook their leg around the paddle and then they hold some sort of net. So it's kind of like the iconic photo that I think a lot of people are seeking to get when they go out on Inlay Lake. And I mean, you can get like kind of a kitschy photo that you can pay for of the men with the traditional nets 
or if your boat driver drives you a little bit further, which is what ours did, you'll just see the men with more of like a traditional style fishing net. Not or not traditional, more modern. Normal, yeah. yeah, modern style tr fishing net, like what we would think of um, in the West. And, you know, they're, they're paddling with their one leg, balancing on the front of the boats, and using both their hands for the net. So I thought that that was really, really amazing to see. Yeah, it's... There, so definitely once you come on the lake, there's a couple of people who aren't actually fishing. They're just standing there to take pictures on their boat. And they have the kind of baskets that you've probably seen. Most people have photos of. But all the normal people fishing don't actually have those baskets. But they still do a similar style with just their um, regular fishing net that you would expect to see anywhere. Um, and it's, it's still interesting because Myanmar hasn't been open for that long. So I feel like not too many people have maybe take, realize that there's an opportunity to just do stuff like that. Like, obviously, there's a couple people who are like, oh, I don't even need to fish. I can come out here and stand on my boat, and people just give me money to take photos. Um, but there's still, you know, 99% of the people fishing in the lake are there, like, legit fishing. But I, it'll be interesting to see how that changes over time because it'd be annoying as a fisherman if you're just out there fishing and, you know, there's probably, it seems like, a 100 tourist boats going out in a day. At least. Just, like... You know, the long boats with probably like between three and five people on them, so not a ton of people. Um, but yeah, if you're just out there fishing, you're like, oh, these white people continually come around and take photos of me. This is annoying. <laughs> and already in these floating villages, they've got like, oh, this is like the silver shop. This is the lotus weaving shop. This is the other thing where they've created these kind of tourist gift shops to take people around to. But it still looks like that's still a fairly small part of village life for the people living out on the lake. Yeah, and I think that that wasn't really a highlight for either of us because we've done a ton of stuff like that through our travels, particularly in South America. There's a lot of popular South American countries that have kind of capitalized on turning a, like authentic living into more of like a kitschy tourist experience. Um, something that I really like though is just driving the boat drove through some different like canals and kind of like floating villages and I was amazed by the fact that there were like actual like kind of towns that were kind of in this shallow water up on stilts and you know we saw children and cats on boats and people playing in the water people bathing in the water people kind of just living their day-to-day -day life and then we also saw electricity poles so they actually have electricity in these towns and yeah, I mean, there's electricity, there's satellites, there's people with smartphones. Yeah, it's just this very interesting... And there's, so these are, like, wooden houses that look like fairly normal, kind of like, you know, run-of-the-mill, shacky houses, um, just built on stilts, because the lake's very shallow. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was just going to say. It's, like, interesting to see the differentiation between not having, like, any insulation or, like... You know, the windows are just open. There's no screens or glass or anything like that. And then, you know, to see the people with their smartphones on their, like, old-school longboats that maybe don't even have motors. So that was definitely an interesting part to see. Um, but the tour was great. I'm happy that we got to actually go on the lake. The lake was definitely worth it for me because before then, with the rain, I was kind of like, this, this town was, like, a pain in the ass to get to. It was unpleasant to get to. And, you know, there's some great... There's some decent restaurants there, but it's not, like, the greatest place to hang out. So I was excited to actually see the lake before we made our way onwards to Mandalay. Yeah, and then, so yeah, we got quite lucky. It, the afternoon turned into a beautiful, sunny afternoon. Um, so we got some nice shots of, like, the lake when it was kind of cold and cloudy and the sun while it was warm, warming up. Um, and another cool aspect of Inlay Lake is that it's quite a bit higher in elevation. So if you've been in Yangon for a while, maybe even on the beaches in the south of Myanmar, you're probably a little bit tired of the heat. Uh, and it's very temperate, even a little bit cold up in Inlay, especially because we're here in the winter. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we took an overnight bus to Mandalay. We had booked on with JJ Express, which is kind of known to be the best bus company for tourists in Myanmar. Um, it's You can buy, like, VIP buses through a lot of the bus lines, and what those are is there's three seats instead of four. They're bigger seats. They recline a little bit more. Um, they rec recline quite a bit more, but you don't actually have a ton of leg room, so it kind of creates an issue. Um, yeah, it was fairly uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, so the first one we had up to in a lake wasn't great. It was decent. Uh, JJ were like, okay, we got really excited because we had heard good things. And I do think they are the best bus company, but I think it's just like 
everything's hit and miss here. Yeah. And, you know, we've had a lot of learning experiences since being in Myanmar, but one of the things that was a little bit frustrating yesterday is we go to get on the bus and obviously somebody had kind of screwed up when they, they picked our seats and the seats that we were put in or that we were, had purchased were not actually seats that they would normally sell to tourists because they're at the very back of the bus. So it's super bumpy. They don't recline at all. So I was fairly angry and frustrated. Thankfully, there were two seats that were empty that we were able to move into. So that kind of resolved that. But still, yeah, I felt like I was doing like the man spread because the person in front of me was like so reclined that it, there were, actually wasn't space for my legs, which, you know, I'm 5'7". I'm not that tall. I'm not that big. So that was a little bit like crazy to experience after having paid like $21 each for this bus, which is pretty steep in Myanmar. Yeah. But it's, so it's what we were sitting there at the bus station waiting. Um, a brilliant new JJ express bus came up and picked up the people going to big N and then we were going to Mandalay and we were like, kind of got excited from seeing that bus. And then the next one came and it was like older, beaten up a bit. Um, but I, I still think it's like important to recognize like very poor developing country. Um, you know, it's still a nice bus, like big seats. I'm sure people would have killed for the tourists traveling to Myanmar a few years ago would have killed for that. Or like uh, even the people who can't afford that cause it's quite expensive for them and who ride like in the back of, you know, a pickup truck that has like benches on either side. So I think that's, that's something that I'm really learning is like, you know, my life is quite easy. My life is quite quite um what's the word i'm looking for it's like it's filled with luxuries that people in a developing country don't have and i think that lowering expectations is something that's really important as a traveler from a first world country in myanmar is you know the people are really trying to provide a good experience for tourists and it just you know doesn't always meet sort of our expectations of what customer service should look like or what a VIP bus should be like and i think you know it's been a struggle it's been really challenging being here in that regard but it's been a really really eye opening eye opening learning experience yeah so we are uh, in mandalay for about a day and a half heading to began and then we return to mandalay to catch our flight home um mandalay it's definitely like the second city of Myanmar. A lot more people spend a lot more time in Yangon, although there's quite a bit of stuff to do in Mandalay. We kind of heard going in that every, everyone basically we talked to was like, yeah, Myanmar, like, or sorry, uh, Mandalay, mm, not the best. Um, so, yeah, we're going to spend the afternoon checking some stuff out, uh, and we will check in with you later. So going to Mandalay after Inlay Lake is actually a little bit unconventional. Most people either come to Inlay from Bagan and then go to Yangon or go from Inlay to Bagan. Not many people go straight to Mandalay. Mandalay is kind of the end of a lot of people's trip or skipped altogether. Yeah, or even the beginning, like a starting point. But yeah, I think obviously from our last clip, you can hear that the bus going from Inlay Lake to Bagan was a lot nicer than our bus going to Mandalay. And I think that just shows the demand for it is there a little bit more than people going to Mandalay. Yeah, and so we were going to Mandalay because we had a commitment that required good internet. And maybe being a bit naive, we were thinking, okay, well, we've got to get to a big city to get good internet. It is off and on all over Myanmar, you don't really know what you're going to get. And so we found a hostel or a hotel in Myanmar that had good Wi-Fi, and it worked out well for us. So I'm glad we went, but we probably would have been fine in Bagan as well if we'd picked the right place to stay. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to find information about what places have good Wi-Fi or not, but we just did some Google searching, ended up putting our trust into some review that said good Wi-Fi on Agoda, and thankfully it ended up working out. I think you're definitely right, though. Like We probably could have found the same thing in Bagan. Bagan's a little bit tougher because it's split between New Bagan, Old Bagan, and Nguyen Yu. So looking into it, I already felt like there was this research element as to where the best place to stay in Bagan was, and then to add the Wi-Fi on top of that, it just seemed a lot easier to go to Mandalay and know that we'd have a generator with a hotel in case the power went out and that, you know, everything was going to be fine. Yeah, and so Mandalay is, like we said in the clip, the second city of Myanmar, and definitely not as much on the tourist radar. There's not a ton of stuff to do, but the main attraction is an old teak bridge called the Ubain Bridge, 
which you've most likely seen photos of if you follow any travel people on Instagram. Yeah. And so it's popular to go to either at sunrise or sunset and being that we were not super keen on getting up really early to go because it is about 30 minutes outside of the city center, we decided to go for sunset. So as with any popular place for sunset, it was crazy busy, um, obviously nearly impossible to get a photo without people in it. Um, but the sunset was absolutely spectacular. Some of, I think, the best photos I took on our entire trip in Myanmar. And it's kind of funny looking back on it now we had our first experience in Mandalay. We went to Began, and then we came back to Mandalay and had a different experience. And it's it's funny to look at it because the first time we were there, we had very low expectations. Everyone was like, Mandalay sucks. <laughs> uh, and we got there. We were kind of enjoying it. It's chaotic. It's a bit crazy. But we found some good places to eat. Um, got out of our comfort zone. Did some cool stuff. But then when we came back the second time, we were in a different mood, different expectations, and it didn't work out as well. Yeah, and so we'll, we'll leave the mysteriousness of that ambiguous for now so that you can find out later what that's all about. But yeah, I definitely agree. I feel like I had really low expectations of Mandalay. I just hoped it was a good hub for internet. And we found a great affordable place to eat good shan noodles, which is the local dish there, which is kind of a rice noodle dish, maybe a little bit like like pho. Yeah, ish. Um, and... Our hotel was great. It was in a good location. Places were in walking distance. They booked us like a great affordable car with a guy who was awesome, who took us to and from the Ubane Bridge. We had some good food while we were there. So I, I felt like I really enjoyed our experience in Mandalay. Yeah, and so we went from Mandalay to Began, which is definitely the number one attraction in Myanmar, the, well, the reason a lot of people go in the first place. And if you look on a map, this is one of those distances where you look on a map and think, oh, wow, they're like next door neighbors. Like you could you know, bike over to Bagan. Not really. <laughs> you could probably bike faster than busing. <laughs> but so yeah, we hire a bus and this is the route from Inlay to Bagan. You can get on a coach direct. It's nice. But since Mandalay is a bit closer, you, the only way you can do it is with a minibus. And if you're riding a minibus in a developing country, there are just so many shenanigans going on. They're picking up people. They're dropping off people. There's random stuff being piled on the buses. There's a wheel that someone brought on the bus, like a large wheel. Um, and it just takes forever to get out of the city to make the distance because it's picking up people, trying to you know get people on and off, and then to get into the next town. Uh, so it's yeah quite an event. Yeah, and on top of that, two two very cultural things in Myanmar are chewing sunflower seeds and chewing uh, betel. And the betel has a very distinct smell to it, and it's usually men who chew it. It makes their mouths like super red, and they spit into a bag. So there's like a bunch of bags at the front. The not the driver, but sort of the bus minibus operator would like hand out bags and you just hear this like chewing, the smell, and then this spitting happening. And <laughs> just thinking about it makes me feel a little bit nauseous. It's definitely not not my cup of tea. So after like six hours in this minibus, which, you know, according to Google Maps, it should have taken us three hours. Another moment where I was like, I wish I just had a little bit more money so we could have just like hired a private car to take us because it would have taken half the time. Yeah, that's definitely the pro tip. If if you're in Mandalay going to Began or in reverse and you know, even if you're like having dinner and there's like two people who are making the same trip, if you guys get get together four people, take a private car, massive massive improvement because the minibus is not cheap. It's there's no other options, so it's kind of like marketed to tourists. Uh it's cheap but not exceptional and then it's just crazy adventure. Yeah. And so we check in with you after we arrive in Bagan and take you around to some of the temples. We have arrived in Bagan and we're about to get our e-scooter so that we can begin exploring the temples. So we will check in from some of the temples and let you know how we're liking Bagan. So we are currently sitting at the Shuazagan Pagoda, which is located closer to the Nguyen Yu portion of <laughs> Bagan. And so the way Bagan, Bagan is kind of broken up is between Nguyen Yu, Old Bagan, and New Bagan. So we're actually staying in New Bagan, which um, is probably about 10 or so kilometers from where we currently are. To the south. 
Yeah, to the south. And so we rented e-bikes, which are electric bikes, which is something that a lot of tourists seem to get here. It's only a couple dollars a day to to get them, so it's a super affordable way. And I'm super scared of motorbikes, so it's been a little bit of an uncertain morning for me. But we've made it here successfully to see the biggest pagoda that's in the Big Ann area. What do you think so far? Yeah, it's been a pretty fun adventure. I was a little bit worried when we got on the bikes. Um, they're effectively electric mopeds. So um, the roads are somewhat iffy in spots, but generally decent. Uh, it's pretty easy to get around. We actually took a wrong turn and ended up going to Noang Yu instead of Old Bay Gam, which is why we're here. Um, and while we're here, quite a few of the pagodas have actually been covered up, at least the stupas have, um, for repairs of some sort. So here, which is the biggest um, and big gold stupa, um, is actually covered in gray sheets of some variety over scaffolding as they repair it or do something to it. Yeah, it's kind of too bad that it's covered up since we're only here for a couple days. It doesn't look like it's opening anytime soon, and we're here in busy season, which makes it a little bit more disappointing, but I mean, there's nothing we can do about it. There's about 2,000 or so pagodas in this area and temples that we can go see. So I I don't think it's going to ruin the entirety of our being here. Yeah, and and it is cool just driving up um, up here. You're on a kind of back roads, rural area, dusty, dry. Um, There's palm trees around. All three towns border on the the river. Um, But when you're further away, it is kind of trippy. You just see these like kind of slowly wearing away temples all over the place uh, somewhat similar to temples of Angkor but Angkor but just a lot less people and they're all um, stupas and Buddhist temples yeah and these ones look a little bit differently the one that we're looking at right now is covered in gold um, minus the the construction work that's going on and then there are some that are more like brick or stone like so we've seen a couple of those on our bike ride and we're going to visit a couple more this afternoon So we'll check in a little bit later. So the last time we checked in, we were at the very first pagoda stop of the day, and the day kind of just flew by from there. We went to a couple more pagodas that are kind of the Nguyen Yu towards Old Bagan area, and then we stopped in Old Bagan for some lunch because it was crazy hot out and The landscape here doesn't give much coverage, so you go to the pagodas and you're kind of just being like beat on by the sun. So we stopped for some lunch before heading back out again. And by the time we were done lunch, it was, it was getting pretty late into the afternoon. We hung out at the restaurant called The Moon for a while. And then we headed down to some of the more popular pagodas in the old Bagan area where you can see the sunset. And there's one really popular pagoda that I don't know the name off the top of my head, but we'll find out for the show notes. And we actually went to one that was less popular. So it was the North or the South Goonie. Uh, it has a <laughs> Burmese or a Myanmar name uh, that's more technical than that. But there's two Goonie temples and you can climb up the South one. And it's a lot less popular. So we could see the popular one with all of the people. And I would highly recommend watching the sunset there. And then from there, we made our way back to our hotel and took showers because Big Ann is super, super dusty at the moment since it's dry season. And we're kind of like covered in dust after a day on the e-bikes. What did you think of the bikes? Um, so yeah, like we mentioned earlier, they're mopeds effectively, but yeah, they're really good. They're, uh, like driving a moped. Yeah. I think we both felt a bit nervous about going out in the streets here with them, but I would definitely recommend renting one while you're here. I think it's quite a bit cheaper than a taxi and just allows you so much more freedom. Yeah, it allows you to go from pagoda to pagoda quite easily. Um, Lots of other foreigners are doing that. It seems like lots of the local people are just used to foreigners. Everyone will honk at you if they're going to pass you and that sort of thing. And I mean, the the e-mopeds or the e-bikes go pretty slow. I think we were going like maybe 30 kilometers an hour. So you don't. It's not likely that you're going to get into that much trouble going that slow. But yeah, overall, really fun. I was terrified this morning, and I'm excited to get back on it tomorrow. So we will check back in with you a little bit later. So we are just walking up the street from our hotel to dinner to conclude the second day here in Bagan. We went out this morning very early for sunrise, 
Um, we just got back from sunset, and we explored quite a few temples during the day on our e-bike. And you can hear in the background the other common sound from Beigan, which is the scooter, which all the locals drive around. Um, what did you think today, day two in Beigan? Um, I love the sunrise. The sunrise is a highlight of our entire time in Myanmar for me. Just watching the sun come up over the temples and then seeing the hot air balloons was something I was really looking forward to, and it definitely didn't disappoint me. Yeah, so we did, we got a recommendation from our friend Felix Mance, who was featured on the podcast over a year ago with his uh, story of driving to Mongolia. Um, he'd previously been to Myanmar and sent us some recommendations for sunrise and sunset, which we'll repost in the show notes. Um, and bear with us with all these butchered pronunciations. So it was La Ka U Shuang um, for sunrise, which is near the very popular sunrise pagoda, but um, quite a bit less busy. Uh, and then we did sunset at the popular, um, the popular spot. Yes, and then so tomorrow is our third and last day here in Bagan, and we're actually taking a bit of a day trip out of the out of the town of New Bagan to Mount Papa, which is actually um, commonly misnamed. The thing we're going to is a volcanic cap with a monastery on top. We'll have some cool information while we're there tomorrow, um, but it looks it looks like a cool adventure. Yeah, I'm super excited about it. It's pretty dusty here in town, so I'm hoping that maybe we can kind of escape the dust and the e-bikes for, for a day before we head back to Mandalay. Yes, yeah, so we will check in with you guys from the future. So the popular sunset pagoda that we mentioned not by name in that clip is the Shwizanada pagoda. And we'll put a link for that in the show notes because I'm... 99.999% certain that that's not the correct pronunciation of that pagoda. Um, be aware that that is the most popular place to watch sunset. Um, it's, it's great to go there. There's lots of different levels that you can watch sunset from. We found a spot pretty easily. It was just fine to take photos without people being around. But if you're looking for more of like an intimate experience, not shared with a hundred or so other people, that probably isn't the place and there there are other pagodas you can go to yeah but but any of the like the good ones to watch it at you're going to run into crowds but the crowds are especially big there because that's where the tours go yeah and i think that maybe that's something that we could touch on as well because you know felix matt sent us this great recommendation for a sunrise pagoda and so going there i kind of expected like oh maybe we'll be like the only people there we arrive like well before the sun is coming up and there was probably already like 15 20, 15, 20 plus, people. Yeah. So not that, not that many people, but you know, people were already lined up kind of the front area where the best view would have been. There was a couple of people doing some sun salutations as the sun rose. Um, so I think it is like quite challenging just as tourism increases in Myanmar to find a place where you're going to be all by yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And so one other thing I wanted to touch on is the hot air balloons, because that's a really popular activity that you can do in Myanmar. Unfortunately, it wasn't in the budget for us. And so maybe it's a trend that's kind of just coming up in this episode, but I think you can definitely travel Myanmar on a budget, but there are some activities or some experiences that are just slightly more enjoyable if you have a little bit more money. Um, hopefully there'll be more competitors in the hot air balloon industry popping up in Myanmar, in Bagan specifically. But as of right now, the experience is 300 to 400 US dollars. And if that's something that really excites you, just as a heads up, you know, budget that money in for your trip. It looks absolutely amazing. And I, it, you know, it's on my list to go back and do that at some point when I have a little bit more money. Yeah. And, and just to clarify, though, you don't even get to watch sunset in the hot air balloons. They only go up once the sun's already come up. Yeah. I think that I, I was kind of sad at first that I couldn't do the hot air balloon experience. It's something that I really wanted to do. And then after experiencing watching the sunrise and then watching the hot air balloons come up, I was like, oh, they don't even really get to watch the sunrise. I kind of go after. I think it's probably still a really, really amazing experience, but I don't think that you necessarily have to do that to feel like you've experienced the temples of Bagan. Yeah. And then one other point about the sunset temple, when you go into the Bagan area, if you're on a bus or you know, on a tour, or take the boat in, your driver will take you to this point where you're forced to pay a fee to just go, you know, be there. Um, I, I think at the time we were there, it was $20. It was like 20 or 25 
And the Sunset Temple is actually the only place where they check tickets. So it's hard to get into Bagan without paying the fee. But if you do manage to do it, the Sunset Place is the only place where they actually check tickets. Yeah. You didn't hear it from us, though. Yeah. <laughs> And so we, as we mentioned, had planned a day tour to Mount Popa, which we were both really excited to have an experience with. But the restaurant that we went to for dinner right after we recorded that clip had something funky in the food because I spent the entirety of the night in the bathroom very, very ill. Probably the sickest I've been in a number of years. And We'll spare you the audio <laughs> clips of that. Yeah. Oh, God. Be, like, absolutely horrible. Uh, and so the next morning I was like, yeah, I feel better. I haven't thrown up for like two hours. I can go. And then I stood up and was like, no, no, I can't go. And so we ended up canceling the day tour, changing our bus. So it was a little bit earlier. And I spent most of the day just sleeping, trying to feel a little bit better from food poisoning. And we hinted at this before when you were talking about Mandalay, but we went back to Mandalay and I got sick pretty soon after. And then because we had returned to Mandalay earlier, we had two full days in Mandalay before we were leaving, but we were both feeling ill. Mandalay is hot, hard to find safe, clean food there. So the first time we were there, we were kind of like, oh yeah, we're getting out of our comfort zone, eating random food. And then when we got back, we were just like, we just want clean food. We just want, you know, a cool place to be. Yeah, and unfortunately, we didn't get to do some of the things that I wanted to do. For example, you know, hiking up the the Mandalay Hill to see the sunset was something that was on my list that I really wanted to do. And by the time I was feeling better, Ryan was sick. And so we spent a lot of time inside of our hotel room, to be quite honest, just really wanting to be outside of Myanmar. Um, Because anyone who has had food poisoning, you know that it's not like 24 hours later, you're just eating whatever again. So my stomach was pretty rocky for like a week, probably two weeks before I was fully back to like my normal appetite and comfortable eating things. Um, Cauliflower made me sick and it took me almost two months before I was even able to like look at a cauliflower floret without recounting that horrible, horrible night. Um, so fortunately the place that we had booked for our last couple of nights in Mandalay was really close to an awesome cafe, perhaps one of the only like air conditioned sort of westernized cafes in Mandalay. And we check in with you from that cafe. Today we, we got our bus back to Mandalay. After the bus to Began, we were kind of worried that it was going to be kind of a bit of a shit show. Um, but it was actually pretty good last night. It takes, it takes a really long time to get a relatively short distance. Yeah, when you look on Google, like directly from Began to Mandalay, it should be like three and a half hours, and it takes like close to six when you consider all like the pickups and drop offs and that sort of thing. So we arrived at our hotel last night at like 10.30, I think, and I basically like got into bed and passed out. I was so exhausted. And today is our my second last day in Myanmar, our second full day in Mandalay. So we're currently at a coffee shop called Nova Coffee, which feels a little bit like home, actually, which I kind of like. It's like a modern coffee shop. And we're going to go explore the palace and kind of just take it easy since I'm still on the mend from food poisoning. Do you have anything that you're really looking forward to with Mandalay? Not really, to be honest. Like Since we've been here before, we've kind of gotten a lay of the land. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the trip running its course. But yeah, trying to enjoy the last like, 48 hours here. Yeah, so I think that that's something maybe we could just touch on briefly is like we're both... Like pretty tired. Myanmar has been amazing with some beautiful scenery. The people are really friendly. The food's actually really good if it doesn't give you diarrhea. Um, but it's it's been a challenging place for us to travel, and it's it's been tiring as well. So I think that both of us are kind of like, okay, it's like two week trip has been fun, but we're like ready to get back to the land of good Wi Fi and get back into our regular routine. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think it's great to go for two weeks and check out um i think too if you were doing it as a a a vacation from home even longer would work because then you can go and explore more and you know you're just going back home afterwards for us there's been a lot of points of time where it's just like everything's kind of a bit of a hassle everything's a little bit awkward because it is somewhere where um it's been kind of 
regulations and government rules have kind of prevented it from being open to tourism for so long that uh, everything's a bit of a hassle. And, you know, we're still just kind of getting used to it. Yeah, I think it would actually be somewhere that would be really interesting to travel if you weren't well-traveled because it seems like people, for the most part, aren't trying to, like, scam you or take advantage of you. Like, it seems like tourism is so new that they're just really excited to, like meet foreigners, and especially if they've practiced English, they're excited to talk to you, but we travel to so many places where the tourism has gone beyond that, and they've realized that, you know, they can steal your stuff, or they can take advantage of you, or they can try at least, and I think that I've really tried to, like, let my guard down and just smile and be open, but there's, like, a part of me in the back of my mind that's like, oh, are they talking to me because they're gonna, like, try and pull something funky, and I think that if you hadn't maybe, like, traveled other parts of Southeast Asia, or South America especially, as a lot of that, you might just, like, genuinely be like, wow, they're, like, so receptive and have such great customer service. I've really tried to just take it as it is, but there has been, like, this lingering sort of thing in the background that's like, oh, is there something more that's wanted out of this instead of just good customer service? And that was kind of, I think, Began is, like, the place so far where it's, like, the most touristic place, so there's the most people trying to, like, get stuff from you. So after being there for a few days, I feel like that kind of burns you out, too, where people are just, like, unrelentingly trying to sell you postcards and whatever, everything. Uh, Lacquered pottery. Yeah, so you just, like, after a few days, you're just like, ugh. And it's hard because, like, you can definitely feel sympathy for the situation they're in. Um, but when you're just kind of asked over and over and over and over again, it's, it's interesting, too. It's not as bad as that Temples of Angor, but definitely getting there. Yeah, for sure. So we'll check in a little later. So after we finished eating at Nova Cafe, we actually rented bikes from our hotel and we biked our way over to the palace, which is kind of in central Mandalay. It was only about like 20, 25 minutes to go there. And the palace is actually walled and has a moat around it, which kind of intrigued me because that's very like out of a fantasy novel for me. I never really actually experienced that firsthand. So it was kind of interesting to see. And we went into the palace. You have to pay a fee as a foreigner. But when you go in, there's only certain areas that you can actually go and explore. Like it, it's, and it's not even certain areas, just one middle area. Yeah. I, I was kind of a little bit perplexed, I guess is a good word. Like I hadn't done too much research about it. I just read in the guidebook that it was an interesting experience to have. So we bike our way over there and we go in and these guards took our passports at the front and you have to leave your bikes outside and then you walk in and there's one road that you walk into and then one area that you go to and basically you just look at some temples and some old homes, some traditional like Burmese style homes. There's one tower you can go to the top of and then there's like signs everywhere that say that you can't go anywhere else. So it wasn't super, super exciting or super fun. It was not that exciting what we were able to check out. And I found it a little bit like disconcerting that there was these areas that we weren't able to like walk through at all. There's military all around and I kind of left feeling like that's not the type of tourist activity I want to be putting my money towards. Yeah. And so it's definitely expensive and your money definitely goes directly to the government. Um, so I think for both of us, definitely like a firm, not recommended place to go. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's just not good, if it was good, not specifically because, you know, you have to pay money that it's going to go directly to the government. Like um, you don't really which, even learn anything about what's happening at the palace or the history of the palace, or you don't really learn anything. Like I just felt like it was like, Oh, here's this one area that you can go to as a foreigner. You're in the palace. And then it's like, but what about like 90% of the rest of the area? Well, like what's going on here? And you would don't have any information about it at all. So yeah, I think that that was probably our only like upfront experience with, I guess the government and the military within Myanmar. And it was kind of this gentle reminder to me of like, Oh wow, this country really has this terrible background and had military intelligence. And, you know, they were very, very, very restricted for a lot of years. And 
not that I ever didn't know that. I knew that the whole time, but I think it's easy when you go to a place like Began and you can rent an e-scooter and you're joyfully going around and seeing these beautiful, amazing sunrises and sunsets to all of a sudden remember, you know, the history of the country and the reality of the things that are still happening there. Yeah. And it's, it's the contrast that jumps to my mind is Cambodia. So when you go to travel Cambodia, even though, um, things have changed a lot in Cambodia and it's been a, a little bit longer. So you get places where you can go, you can go see, uh, the killing fields and S 21 prison, and you kind of get a touch for the horrors of the past of that place. And in Myanmar, those are very much there, but very much still covered up Yeah, by the government. Um, but so you, as a traveler, it's, I think, easy to come away with like this rose-colored vision about uh, this place with beautiful temples and friendly people and to miss some of the, some of the darkness that's there from the past. Yeah. And I think that it's really important to understand those things, at at least for me personally. I found that reading Finding George Orwell in Burma, which I mentioned in the last episode of this, was really helpful for me to kind of understand the past in a really interesting way. I would highly suggest finding some sort of online articles or some books that intrigue you, though, if you're going to be going to Myanmar and really get some some insight into, you know, what has happened in the country, what is happening in the country. It's something that we didn't necessarily do in the past. And I found that it's kind of along the lines of like things that you can learn better abroad and history is, is a huge one. So if you educate yourself before you go to a country, then you can kind of see the country a little bit differently. And I felt that that was very true for me in Myanmar and a suggestion that I would, I would make for anyone who's planning to travel there. And then So in that last clip, we sound a little bit down, and I think that that's very accurate as to what we were experiencing at that point. Um, I was, like I said before, the sickest I've been in a lot of years. And for anyone who's traveled, you know that being sick abroad is one of the worst things, and especially in a country where you're not comfortable. And then that was followed within probably 24 hours of you getting sick. And so we were just very ready to not be in Myanmar anymore. But I think we want to end this episode with some overall thoughts of Myanmar because those last couple of days are not really accurate, I think, to like our overall experience in Myanmar. I think that overall, I felt like the country challenged me and opened my eyes um, to new things and was so photogenic so we took so many amazing photos there, but then also had this like underlying layer of darkness and history, which was really interesting to learn about. Um, what are your overall thoughts of Myanmar? So I think that it was really, it was good for me from a perspective of just seeing this place where kind of shaking off a half century of our super repressive socialist government. Um, and you're starting to see what it's like for a country to come out of that. And so you get this firsthand experience of seeing, you know, men who are running the thing to block the train tracks or men who are taking money to run a pair of binoculars at a tourist attraction, all these places where these jobs would have been automated so long ago. But in Myanmar, there's so little opportunity that it's still man powered. Um, so I, I feel like it really like widens your perspective being able to go there and see that something that's kind of troubled me about Myanmar and specifically the conversations we've had with backpackers about it is this line that everyone puts out there about, Oh yeah, you should definitely go before it gets too touristy. Um, and I think that there's something to that. That's a, like an interesting point. Like, it is an interesting period of time to go and to see this transition that's happening. But I think that it's a mistake to forget that there are, you know, real people who have really been struggling there for a really long time. And it's really great that there is a tourist economy that's growing in Myanmar and that it's becoming touristy because that means a lifeline for a lot of people who are in the country. Yeah. It's something that we talked a lot about off, off of the podcast and something that we really, 
considered when we made the decision as to whether or not we wanted to go to Myanmar. And I kind of at first was like, you know, I heard people saying, go before it gets too touristy. And I was like, yeah, yeah, like I want to go before it gets too touristy because you go to these these places where it almost feels like there's no culture anymore because they're catering to what Westerners or what tourists want. And I was like, I want to experience Myanmar before that. And then I thought more about it and was like, well... I also don't want these people to continue to live in like poverty and repression. And people are very, very, very poor in Myanmar and they have been very repressed. So for tourism to change and expand and to have more people bringing money into the country is really good for people to thrive and create businesses and be able to make more money and provide more opportunity for young people. And so I think, you know, we both concluded that that was one of the reasons we wanted to go was to be able to support those people and to like, come away from it, not with the mindset of go before it's too touristy. I think definitely go, go if you're intrigued by Myanmar, um, go if you're intrigued by the interesting time period that it's in now, but don't discredit it, you know, five or 10 years from now, just because there's more tourism. Yeah. And, and to that point, there's, when you see all these photos and like you said, it's a beautiful photogenic place, but those photos are kind of telling a lie about what it's like in Myanmar. You see the beautiful sunsets and the hazy smoke covered temples and hot air balloons and worn down colonial buildings. And they make for, for good photos, but day to day life there, even as a tourist is challenging. Uh, it's not that comfortable. You're likely to get sick. You're going to be put through hassles. So I think that you definitely shouldn't hide from that. And but that's not what we're about presenting on our podcast. You know, when you look at your friend's photos of, of somewhere like Myanmar, you don't get the sense for, hey, this is what it's really like there. Like, you're probably going to get diarrhea and you're probably going to get annoyed at the battle chewing guy who's like rubbing up against you in the minibus. And you're probably going to be a bit tired of staying in this rundown guest house that costs like three times more than it would if you were in Thailand. Yeah, for sure. And I think that that's something that we've tried to accurately portray through our social media. And I know through mine specifically, it's it's challenging, though, when you're in a beautiful place. Like, how do you take a photo of something really beautiful and then caption with it? Like, behind me was a disgusting, stinky pile of garbage and children playing in it. Um, so there's definitely, like, a challenge with that. But, yeah, I think that it's important to to understand that there are challenges there. And, I mean, as travelers listening that's often why we want to travel. We want to travel to push ourselves outside of our comfort zones. And I feel like Myanmar is a really great place to do that because there can be discomfort just within the level of poverty. Because if you haven't traveled to other developing countries, it might be the poorest place that you've been. Yeah. It's certainly, certainly a possibility. Um, and even within Southeast Asia, Lao is right in that neighborhood. Um, and, and then the, the final point I want to touch on is just that this is still the same government that was responsible for that repression, largely. Many of the same military figures are still in power. There, it's a new leading party, but it's really debatable how much power they actually have. Um, and, and you know that there are, there are currently serious human rights issues in Myanmar. So the Rohingya people, which is a Muslim population, there's many people who would say that What's happening to them is like bordering on genocide. Um, there's active conflicts with tribal drug lords in the north of the country. And as recently as, you know, like half a decade ago, I think close to 100,000 people died in a hurricane because the government wouldn't let foreign aid in. And so you can go there now and travel this limited geographic area, which composes a lot of the country and have good, interesting experiences. But we don't want to present, present the good side of Myanmar without, with, and, and, you know, cast a shadow over those bad things because those things are hidden from you because you're not going to travel that. And everyone who's going to travel there is going from Yangon to Inlay to Mandalay to Began. And so I think that's a question you need to ask yourself. Is it, you know, am I supporting the system when I go or am I, you know, doing something that's good for the people there and supportive? And I think that's a really hard answer to come to. 
And I, our answer was like, I think that the tourist economy is, you know, a good thing. And I think that we get personal value out of it. And I don't feel like I'm supporting the situation there. I think that it's the liberalization that's going on is going to eventually hopefully bring down that and get those people out of power. Yeah. And I think too, it's like being able to write about it, being able to talk about about it being able to share experiences there um, with other people is is something that really drew me to being there. It was like, if I can go and see what it's like, even though I know that I'm seeing, you know, a rosy colored picture and that I'm not seeing the war that's happening over the mountains, um, it's still being able to share, you know, those experiences with other people and being able to talk about them. Yeah. And then one final point on the two touristy thing is we just had so many moments that... I think people might people I think people don't focus on people focus on the traditional in in their tours but we had so many beautiful moments of seeing that modernization firsthand and so for example we were at a restaurant and our server who's probably a you know 17 year old guy and he's wearing a Yeezy for president shirt um and there was another kid who was in a, a, a tr- kind of modified truck taxi thing we were taking and he had a hoodie on and knock off beats by dry headphones and cool sneakers that he'd obviously knock off some somewhere. Um, and there's a moment on a train where these very traditionally dressed girls were on an iPhone in laughing about some video on the internet. And so you get to see firsthand this beautiful transition where this population that has been disconnected from all this amazing stuff that's happening in the world, there's finally a generation that is getting connected in that. And they're growing up not disconnected, not isolated. They're fully a part of this connected global world. And that's amazing to see firsthand. And I think something that sticks with me and kind of affects me from that trip that we had there that we probably wouldn't think about very often if we hadn't gone. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I I felt like we got a really good mix of seeing young people, you know, dressed a little bit differently, maybe dressed more like the Western world. And then we saw so, so, so many people in, you know, the traditional longi, which is the the sort of skirt type thing that the men wear and the women in their traditional gear with their traditional makeup on that I never felt like for a second, even though that there's tourism coming in, that we were getting like... I don't know, like an unauthentic experience. Like I feel like we got, you know, a pretty, pretty good insight into what the culture is like there. Obviously, you know, there's, there's going to be sort of this boundary where you can't fully understand it if you're not immersed in it. But I, I felt like we were still able to get these authentic experiences. So if you're feeling concerned about that, um, I, I don't think there's any need to feel concerned about that. You can still get this sort of like traditional experience as to what like me and Mar culture is like while bringing more money in while seeing the way that you know young people are getting more information yeah absolutely yeah so we're going to post links and photos and more notes and information on the show notes so you can find that at www.theworldwanders.com and if you want to see more of our other photos from Myanmar you can go check us out on Instagram at the world wanders podcast that's the best place to find up to date information or I guess up to date feed of what we're doing and where we are and to see some of our best captured moments from all of our trips including Myanmar to find more information, relevant links, and photos talked about in this week's episode, check out theworldwanders.com. If you have a question, comment, or feedback, send us an email at info at theworldwanders.com. Join our community on Facebook at The World Wanders or on Twitter at World Wanders 1. As always, thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.